Will gold remain an important form of money? Or are cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin set to overtake it? That was the subject of a Soho Forum debate held on Tuesday, July 26th at the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama, as part of Mises University Week, an annual event attended by more than 80 students from around the country. Keith Weiner, CEO of Monetary Metals, defended the resolution, gold will remain an important form of money in the 21st century. Wiener took the position that gold is poised to hold on to the monetary status it's enjoyed for the past 5,000 years, and that its recent performance only confirms why. Pierre Rochard, co-host of the Bitcoin for Advisors podcast, took the negative, arguing that the technological advantages of Bitcoin will make it the preferred medium of exchange in a post-dollar world. This debate was moderated by SOHO Forum Director Gene Epstein. Without any further ado, I want to remind you of the uh, resolution. Gold, gold will remain an important form of money in the 21st century. Please vote initially, yes, no, or undecided on the resolution. Here to defend the resolution, Keith Wiener. Keith, please come to the stage. Taking, taking the negative on the resolution, uh, Pierre Rochard. Pierre, please come to the stage. Okay, I hope you've all voted yes, no, or undecided on the resolution. Connor, please close the voting. Keith, you have 15 minutes to defend the resolution. Take it away, Keith. If this debate were about which asset is better at skyrocketing, also crashing, then I would shake my opponent's hand, concede, and walk off the stage, because Bitcoin is obviously superior at skyrocketing and also crashing. <laughs> However, that is not the debate. The debate is gold will remain money an important form of money in the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, our esteemed moderator, Gene Epstein, my honored opponent, Pierre Richard. In a way, this debate is a bit unfair because gold has been doing what it does for 5,000 years, and the proposition is that it's going to continue doing for the next 100 years what it's been doing for 5,000 years. In a certain sense, good luck to debunking that or arguing against that. But um, there's a lot more to be said, obviously, about money and, excuse me, uh, and, and how all this works. So we live in a system where we have a failing dollar. I don't think that's very controversial in this audience. Some audiences I speak to you say that, people are like, what, what? And then the, the room breaks into pandemonium. But the dollar is designed, this is a feature, not a bug. I'll keep referring to this concept of feature, not a bug. The dollar is designed to go down. The Fed on its website says 2% per year, which they define as price stability. I wonder what Orwell would be saying about that. So the dollar is designed to go down at a steady rate. Why? As a, as a free boon to borrowers. If you borrow money and then the dollar is going down, then what you owe the return of is falling in value. The longer the term of the loan, the greater the fall, the easier the burden on the debtors. And that is how the system, if I can use the word rigged, is rigged. Unfortunately, the dollar doesn't do as they would wish, doesn't do as their theory would predict. And it isn't steady or stable. It is not a simple mechanism for robbing Peter to pay Paul, Peter being the lender on the other. So every trade has two sides. And there's Peter over here who's the saver who's lending his savings to something and expecting to get that back with interest. Well, he's the one who's screwed when the dollar goes down. And then Paul over here, the borrower, is the one who wins when the dollar goes down. Unfortunately for Paul, it isn't a steady, linear, um, monotonic would be the term, uh, progression of going down. It has wicked volatility to it. 
And as we see right now, the dollar is going up, not down, which means the borrowers are finding that their burden of debt is increasing, not decreasing. Oops. Um, and they don't really understand their own system, and so they're running around worrying about inflation in one day and then you know, yield curve inversion the next and the dollar index and, and on and on and on with all this stuff. So savers, when they face this uncertainty, turn to the thing that they've turned to for 5,000 years, which is gold. Now, gold does not pay a return. Now, my company, Monetary Metals, that's actually what we do is we pay investors a return. That proposition is growing. We're hiring. All kinds of good things are happening. I'm not really here to talk about my company. But generally, gold is not expected to pay a return. And the trade-off for that is it doesn't have a risk. It's the thing you have when you don't want to uh, invest or speculate and take a risk. People turn to that. But if they want to get a return, then they have to go to the market. And unfortunately, part of the defect in the dollar is that the yield, the interest rate available to especially retail savers and investors, has been taken away. They waged a war on interest, and unlike all the other wars on, this one they've actually won. It's all over but the shouting. The Fed is now still in the throes of pretending that it can raise interest rates, but in their uh, so far early uh, stages of attempting to do that, all sorts of problems are coming out, and they're going to be forced to reverse, as they were in 2015, as they were in 2007, you know, all over again. So people are turned, if they want a, a yield, and they can't get a yield by financing productive enterprise, then they're forced to turn to a surrogate for yield, which is speculation. So you have to go into the Fed's casino, and you have to put your chips down, and you can bet on stocks, you can bet on real estate, you can bet on fiat currencies. You know, there's, there's a bookie taking orders on everything from Turkish lira to euros and everything in between. Uh, you can bet on... Uh, obviously bonds, you can even bet on Bitcoin. And folks, that is, dare I say, the shabby little secret, with all due respect, of Bitcoin. Its purpose is to be a chip in the Fed's casino for betting to make more dollars. That's what it does. That's what all these other things are increasingly perverted into doing. Equities have become that. Real estate has become that. Um, old artwork, old antique Ferraris, whiskey, wine, you name it, everything has been financialized and turned into a bet uh, in the casino. So let's look at Bitcoin now for a moment. Bitcoin is uh, skyrocketing. Well, not at the moment. Today it was down a few percent, uh, but generally skyrocketing. It has been uh, in quite a, a bull market. And that's not a bug, it's a feature. It is planned, so just as the dollar is planned to go down, Bitcoin is planned to go up. Sounds like a good deal, right? Buy this thing that's going up. Who's on the other side of the trade? And the dollar, the going down benefits the borrower. In, the, in Bitcoin, the going up benefits the, uh, they're not really savers, we'll call them hodlers. Who's on the other side of the trade? Well, that's the problem. In Bitcoin, there is no creative or productive thing generated by Bitcoin. The only way that anybody makes any money is by selling their Bitcoin to fresh new money coming in. So I buy Bitcoin, I give my money away to this gentleman here. My money's gone, I don't get my money back. It is not a conversion of my dollars to Bitcoin. It is a trade. I give him my dollars, I get his Bitcoin, he's out. I'm hoping that it's gonna go up. So far, Bitcoin's been in one hell of a bull market. Eventually, if you wait long enough, it does go up. Maybe, we'll see this time, may or may not be different. And then I sell to this gentleman over here, I don't get my dollars back. It's not a return of my capital. It's this gentleman giving me his capital, which converts to my income to be consumed. So it is a vehicle for conversion of one party's capital to another party's income to be consumed. Nobody wants to be a prodigal son, but speculation, and it isn't just Bitcoin. I mean, it's stocks, it's properties, it's whiskeys, it's everything, have become vehicles to make a prodigal society. We don't want to spend our own life savings down or our family legacy down. We're spending somebody else's through the magic of uh, what we feel is a market. But it's a rigged game, and everybody is forced to be there because the Fed has taken away yield. Everybody needs yield. You can't get yield one way. You turn to the surrogate, which is 
speculation. So Bitcoin is a zero-sum uh, game, um, and it's actually a negative-sum game because it costs a lot of money to run the Bitcoin network. I'm not an expert in this, but I've read a number that's something like tens of millions of dollars per day. The only source of funds to the folks who run the network are the, the new money coming in from new buyers. And so it's a system in which um, the, the, the system is the people that are exiting and the people that are running the network are eating the, uh, the mon some of the money that's coming in. And then eventually, uh, you know, what happens when you run out? So this is my, uh, this is my one slide for today. <laughs> now, in a certain sense, you could say that's a trite tautology. Haha, -ha, one equals one. It doesn't mean anything. Um, I've argued with many Bitcoin folks on uh, Twitter in particular, and a lot of them will say one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. And I, I challenge them and I say, I don't think even you believe that if I had, let's say, a successful restaurant chain that was worth 10 million Bitcoins a decade or so ago, that it's undergone a hyper collapse down to a few tens of Bitcoins now. I don't think anybody really believes that. You realize that it's the unit of measure that's shifting and not the value of the thing being measured. So I wanna, I wanna look at this and what this means in terms of gold because it's not just simply a tautology. I'm not just simply saying one ounce equals one ounce. Austrian economics teaches us that as the quantity of a commodity increases, its utility or value at the margin decreases. I live in Phoenix, it's a very hot desert. This time of year, you could expect temperatures of 115 degrees in the shade. Uh, if you're walking around in the afternoon in the sun, you will go from per perfectly happy to thirsting to death uh, you know, within, within an hour or so. If you come across somebody offering to sell you water, what is the price you're willing to pay for that water? For the first liter, you'd open not just your wallet, your bank account. The second, the third, by the fourth liter, you would refuse it. Everything has a utility that is diminishing at the margin. Gold is not consumed, and it's been continuously mined, so far as we know, for at least 5,000 years. And in those 5,000 years, we have not reached the point where marginal benefit is less than marginal cost. We continue to accumulate more of it without any apparent limit. And what this is saying is that at the margin, gold's utility is not diminishing. The nth plus one ounce has the same value as the nth ounce, which is saying that gold is the closest thing we have to a economic constant. Now compared to Bitcoin. Is this true for Bitcoin? We don't know. In fact, we don't have a way to know because the central planner who designed Bitcoin was terrified that this was not true for Bitcoin and set a hard cap at 21 million units. So we can't run a 5,000 year experiment to see what happens if Bitcoin's quantity keeps increasing. To put this in perspective, every year the miners produce about 3,000 tons of gold, which is uh, worth about $170 billion. That's over half of Bitcoin's current market cap being produced every year in gold. And yet this is still true. Gold's utility at the margin is undiminished. Now, why is, why is it important to have something that's an economic constant? If you look at the firm, if you look at the enterprise, what is the single most important thing that every business owner, operator, manager needs to know? Are we creating wealth? Are we destroying wealth? And how do we measure that? If the very unit in which we measure it is either designed to go down monotonically and have some wicked volatility along the way, or something that has gigantic volatility and gyrations, we would never know whether it was the change in the unit that that restaurant went from 10 million bitcoins to 40 bitcoins in value, or whether it was actually the business that went down. You need something that will give you an objective picture, and gold uh, is that uh, objective picture. One other problem with Bitcoin, and I say the word again, centrally planned, is that somebody, we don't necessarily know who Satoshi is, I think we think we know at this point, decided that 21 million was the magic right number of Bitcoins. He decided 22 million is not the magic right number, 
And 20 million is right out. It kind of feels like Monty Python and the Holy Grail, if you remember the holy hand grenade of Antioch, right? Well, what if that's not right? He also decided that as Bitcoin approaches this 21 million, it is to approach asymptotically. What if that wasn't right? What if it should be linear? What if it should be the other way? Um, these are things that have been decided uh, b by a single person or maybe a small group of people of Satoshi's group. And they constitute Bitcoin's um, central plan. And the net result is that Bitcoin cannot respond to changes in demand except by changes in its price. That was about a minute and a half left. All right, thank you. Which means that with Bitcoin, volatility is not a bug, it's a feature. It cannot be stable. Its design is intrinsically not stable. And so, and just to make my conclusion here, Bitcoin is a pyramid scheme. It does not generate or produce anything. Getting back to the debate proposition, I don't think there's any real debate as to whether gold continues to be for the next 100 years what it's been for the last 5,000 years. The only real questions are one, when does the dollar collapse? And two, when does Bitcoin run out of fresh new blood and fresh new money to continue to feed the pyramid? Those are the actual questions um, that everybody should be thinking about. Thank you, Keith. Um, and uh, uh, now, uh, um, um, please take the soap podium. Uh, uh, Paul P Pierre, uh, you have 15 minutes to take the negative on the resolution. Have a chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, Gene Epstein and, and Soho Forum. Um, I've attended two uh, in the audience, and this is the first one I've uh, had the honor of debating at. Um, I also want to thank the Mises Institute for hosting this and uh, for partnering with the Reason Foundation. It's very uh, ecumenical. And uh, thank uh, Jeff Dice, of course, for the invitation. And um, thank Keith for, for you know, uh, coming to join us here and having this really important conversation. Um, the Mises Institute has a very special place in my heart. Uh, I first went to Mises.org in 2005. Uh, downloaded MP3s and put them on my iPod, as one did back then. Um, as well as uh, when I was in college, I searched a dating website uh, with the keyword Rothbard and uh, found my now wife, and we have two children. So that would just not be possible without the Mises Institute. And um, I want to, you know, especially thank the donors and the scholars and the students here. Um, you know, this, this does affect people's lives and it is important work that you are all doing. Okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, I've been researching Bitcoin since 2013. I'm now the vice president of research at Bright Blockchain. It's one of the largest publicly traded Bitcoin miners. Uh, but like Keith, I'm not here to uh, shill business. Let's, uh, oh, and here's you know, my contact information <laughs> um, if you want to contact me. So um, I think that the, the first uh, really, maybe this is a separate debate, but it's a debate within a debate, is what is money? What's our definition of money? Um, and if you attended Professor Klein's excellent lecture on money yesterday, um, I, I, you know, my impression was that uh, she gave the consequentialist definition, which is really kind of what is the end result of the market process is that you have an asset that emerges as the most saleable, marketable liquid good. Um, and really, um, I think that's, that's a fine definition of what money is in kind of equilibrium. Uh, but uh, as we know, market processes are uh, not, not in equilibrium. And um, if we think about from a first principles perspective of why do we hold money, um, I refer back to an excellent article written by Hoppe um, about uh, the yield on money held. Uh, which is an article written by uh, William Hutt, whose name I see here. Um, and uh, it's really about hedging against uncertain future cash flows. 
So uh, we have a, a lot of uncertainty in the world. And uncertainty has a very specific definition that we would contrast with risk. Uh, uncertainty is unquantifiable. You, you don't know the possible range of outcomes. Um, whereas risk is quantifiable, uh, you, you can have actuarial models and be able to price risk, uh, whereas uncertainty is something that is uninsurable. Um, and the reason we hold money is because there are th future cash flows that are uninsurable. Um, if all future cash flows were known, right, in the evenly rotating economy, then we would be able to uh, not have to hold money because we could prearrange all of our transactions so that, uh, you know, we, we always have uh, this uh, intertemporal double coincidence of wants, which is obviously completely unrealistic uh, given the world that we live in. So we have to hold money. Um, and it has to be, if we're, if we're hedging against uncertainty, I would argue that uh, the money that we have to hold has to be the least uncertain asset uh, possible, right, available to us uh, in order to most fulfill the need, the utility of hedging against uncertainty. Um, okay, so let's uh, kind of dig into uncertainty uh, in a monetary system. Um, I see two places where uncertainty arises when using a money. Uh, one is when you're actually holding it, right? And uh, I, I mean that you know very literally of when you have money uh, on your balance sheet uh, as an asset. And then the second source of uncertainty is when you're actually transacting with it, when you're sending it or receiving it. Um, and these, these two axes, when we evaluate which assets minimize uncertainty on these two axes, this is a subjective evaluation, right? We're engaging in entrepreneurial activity, um, and we might be wrong about which assets have more or less uncertainty. Um, and so I really see today's debate as an entrepreneurial debate rather than uh, really one about uh, theory or praxeology. Um, okay, so Let's get into, uh, well, I'll elaborate here as well, um, although I already touched on some of these topics. Um, Professor Klein had this excellent list of different qualities of money that uh, would allow it to emerge as the most saleable good. Um, and I think that uh, on each one of these qualities, uh, we should look at it through the lens of how do we minimize uncertainty, right, in all of uh, the, the, these regards. So my central contention is that uh, receiving, holding, and sending with Bitcoin has less uncertainty than with gold. And from that, I would expect that the market process would, over the coming years, um, and I think that the proposition is 21st century, so we've got, uh, the, the years are ticking by, but we've got, you know, 70-something years uh, remaining um, of market process before uh, we can finally decide whether Keith or I uh, was correct. Um, but that if, if Bitcoin really does fundamentally have an order of magnitude less uncertainty than gold does, uh, that we would expect Bitcoin to demonetize gold. And I would argue that uh, silver has been demonetized um, already. Um, and you know, if I really wanted to throw a bomb, I would argue that uh, the dollar has already demonetized gold. Uh, and it's only recently that, that gold has uh, reasserted its monetary premium, uh, you know, uh, in, in post 9-11 world. But that really, you know, at, at 2000, when uh, Tony Blair was selling uh, the UK's gold, that uh, maybe that was uh, peak demonetization of gold. But um, I'll let Keith pick on that thread if, if, he, if he finds it to be silly. Um, so... Let's look at it. Um, let's look at the uncertainty when we're receiving uh, an asset. The you know this was uh, highlighted by uh, the professor that came after Professor Klein, uh, but um, I should have I should have met Newman I believe. Uh, he um, pointed out the the issue with counterfeiting. Um, and when we're dealing with a monetary asset, it's critical that we're able to verify the authenticity of that asset, uh, that we're able to combat counterfeiting. And here, I really think that um, gold has an issue of cost. It is very expensive to verify the purity of gold. Um, and that you know, doing an assay and doing a sonogram of your gold bars and gold coins, inconvenience aside, uh, is very expensive, um, and it's something that you would have to do every time you receive gold, right? If uh, and um, now 
Furthermore, it has another limitation, which is that uh, even when you do verify your own gold, you're not verifying everyone else's gold. So um, as it was pointed out, the counterfeiting negatively affects all gold holders, right? Not just uh, the ones that are uh, being cheated uh, by uh, receiving counterfeit gold. Um, so I would contrast this with Bitcoin, where you're able to cryptographically verify uh, the Bitcoin that you receive using what's called a Bitcoin node. Um, and in this, uh, with this software, you don't need to trust anyone. You're able to firsthand verify not only the authenticity of the Bitcoin that you are receiving, um, but the total supply of Bitcoin as well. Uh, and so this uh, really makes it an order of magnitude less uncertain uh, than gold. And it's easy. It's uh, automated software. So, uh, and it uses cryptography and uh, it's, uh, as far as we know, foolproof. All right, let's go to storage. Um, has anyone here bought a gold vault? Uh, they are very expensive if you want one that is of quality. Um, it has limitations. For one, the gold vault is in a one singular location, right? Uh, Fort Knox is in one location, um, which might seem like, um, okay, well, why is that a problem? Uh, with Bitcoin, you don't have that limitation. Uh, with Bitcoin, you can actually put uh, what are called private keys, which allow you to unlock Bitcoin. Um, you can put those private keys in any number of different locations. And uh, this is a really uh, you know, tangible advantage in terms of security. Um, Professor Klein mentioned that one of the reasons why people don't carry gold around is that it's very hard to secure gold. Um, and I was recently on vacation in France. I was, I was reading uh, about the local history, and uh, there was a chapter about um, the, the problem of theft in this part of France and that uh, farmers could not leave their farms because thieves would come along, break in, and steal their gold. So the locality of gold, the physical locality of gold is a problem. Um, it's one that is, uh, you know, solved by uh, the nation state, which I know that, uh, you know, here we, we would frown upon, but that's the reality of the situation that we're in. Um, furthermore, one of these vaults only lasts, is rated to last 30 minutes against uh, power tools. So uh, if you are not home and the police does not arrive within 30 minutes, they will break into the vault and they'll be able to steal the gold. Um, which means also that if you are dead for whatever reason, right, uh, that perhaps this is a home invasion and, and the home invader, uh, you know, is a criminal and uh, murders you, uh, then they can still access your gold, right? Uh, that's not necessarily the case with Bitcoin, because with Bitcoin, if you had memorized the passphrase and they've murdered you, uh, now they can no longer access the Bitcoin. Um, which also leads us to the final uh, point here on the gold side is uh, with regards to pleading the fifth. This is uh, relevant in the United States. I'm sure that there's different degrees of relevancy outside the United States, but in the US, um, you can plead the fifth in order to not give a password to the government, right? So um, if you have your Bitcoin locked away by a passphrase, uh, the government can't force you, compel you to give up that passphrase and uh, seize your Bitcoin from you. Uh, whereas with gold, uh, all they need is a search warrant and uh, they can certainly seize, uh, you know, gold from a vault. Um, you know, that's uh, unfortunately in the Constitution. Um, okay, now on the gold side, uh, there's uh, really easy ways to store Bitcoin. Um, you could just use your phone, right? There's lots of great uh, Bitcoin wallet apps on your phone that allow you to uh, hold your private keys there. Um, but that would not be minimizing the uncertainty, right? Because uh, phones are actually um, one of the riskier ways of holding Bitcoin. Um, the most secure known way to hold Bitcoin is to use what's called a multi-sig, which allows you in a programmatic way to say, we're going to, in order to spend these Bitcoin, you need two signatures from any three different devices, right? And these devices are generally called hardware wallets or signing devices. Um, here I've got, for example, the cold cards. Um, and, you know, this multi-sig, I, I use two or three as an example. It could be one of five or 10 of 15. 
Uh, there's any number of different combinations that one could have uh, in order to, again, minimize the uncertainty. Um, you can do neat things with multi-sig. You can leave private keys in different legal jurisdictions so that uh, in terms of asset protection in, in, for the government to seize your Bitcoin, uh, they would have to go through international legal process uh, to uh, seize all of uh, the private keys and be able to move the Bitcoin. Um, this cold card... Uh, this latest generation, as far as we know, uh, can resist uh, power tools and lasers uh, for an indefinite period of time. Uh, so the attacker would sooner accidentally destroy the private key than be able to extract it from the device, uh, just making it an order of magnitude um, better than uh, the vault. And it's, again, inaccessible if you're dead and you can plead the fifth. Okay. Um, sending gold versus sending Bitcoin. Uh, when you are sending gold, uh, you are generally recommended to use registered mail through the U.S. Postal Service. Um, and, you know, that's uh, maybe a little bit status, but uh, if you use FedEx or UPS, uh, they, they're, they're apparently much harder to work with. Um, much more expensive to ship gold, uh, it takes much longer, and uh, you're trusting the U.S. government. With Bitcoin... Uh, you can send billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin uh, for very little, right? Anywhere from pennies to dollars worth of Bitcoin in transaction fees. Um, because the fee is based on your data usage. It's not based on the value that you're transacting. Uh, generally, it takes anywhere between 10 to 30 minutes uh, to move your Bitcoin around. Uh, it operates 24-7, and you don't have to trust anyone. You just have to trust your own software. You could write your own software if you want to. Plenty of software engineers have written their own uh, Bitcoin node implementations and Bitcoin wallet implementations. Uh, it's all free and open source. Okay, so just to kind of diagram it out, um, my, my contention is that uh, Bitcoin has an order of magnitude more certainty than gold. Uh, in practice, and so uh, one would expect that uh, gold will replace uh, Bitcoin. Or sorry, Bitcoin will replace gold. Uh, brain fart. Okay. Um, now, um, let's uh, now go to, well, don't I go to the rebuttal or, okay, so now it's Keith's turn. I want to try one little, is this microphone on? Okay. I want to try one little thing. I have a gold coin here. So they're not actually that hard. I want to sit here. Okay. Sorry. But I want to use this table to actually demonstrate something. It may or may not work. So we're trying an experiment live. Yep. There you go. So they're not that hard to carry around. Um, I, I do this fairly frequently. Um, in terms of uh, figuring out fakes, I just figured I would address that. Gold has a very unique sound. And um, every time I go and visit a vault, of which I visited many, sometimes they'll say, hey, we have this fake, we have this real. And one, they decided to test me and said, here's an American gold eagle that's real, and here's one that's fake. And they handed me two coins. We're not going to tell you which one's which. So I dropped both of them one at a time on a piece of, on a, on a, like a granite countertop, which I don't have here. I have a wooden one. But we'll try and see if this works. Is everybody able to hear that? Gold makes a very distinct ringing sound that no other metal comes remotely close. You can tell that instantly. You can also bite it with your teeth. Gold is very soft. There are lots of ways. I'll just put this down. Just put him over here. Um, there are lots of ways that um, uh, historically people could tell fakes. There's a little plastic device that you put the gold in there, and it has to be at least as heavy as gold to flip it this way, and it has to be very small to fit through the slot, so you're proving that gold that the coin has the density that's supposed to have. Almost nothing on this planet has the density that gold does. Um, one of them is tungsten, but tungsten is very hard and not moldable. Platinum is usually more expensive than gold, so nobody would counterfeit gold with platinum. Um, uncertainty. So I think there's two kinds of uncertainty um, that I want to just touch on um, that my um, honorable opponent um, talked about uncertainty but did not address these. One of which is just simply the value of this Bitcoin. And I was there watching on Twitter when Bitcoin was $69,000 and change back in November. And the Bitcoin proponents were obviously extremely bullish 
and recommending to everybody. And I remember getting into an argument with one guy in November at around that price, saying, would you recommend this even to an octogenarian grandma? Yes, absolutely, blah, 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 blah. It's safe, it has certainty, it has all these things. Well, it fell 75% to $16,000. So there's a certain maybe dimension or axis of uncertainty that I think is a really, really key one if we're talking about uncertainty in the world. Uh, and that is the drawdowns are killer, especially if you're past your working age, you're retired, you don't have any further income, um, or you're, you're holding this as a hedge against uncertainty of future cash flows. I like that. I think that was a very elegant way of saying that. You need to know the value of the thing. And again, think the nth plus one ounce is equal to the nth ounce, all the way back to Mises regression theorem. Now think about this from the perspective of coordination in the economy, which, which comes to exchange both of, of present goods and also of finance. In the case of present goods, so suppose I'm a merchant on the internet and I'm selling, I don't know, flat screen TVs, and I wanna get $1,000 for a TV, and there's some merchants now that, that Bitcoiners will say accept Bitcoin. So suppose I actually took Bitcoin onto my balance sheet on a Saturday and by Monday when I go to pay my distributor, these things are pretty low margin. I probably have to pay my distributor 950 bucks. And by that point, Bitcoin's fallen 18%, which it did happen one Monday when I went to tweet. And uh, now I have $820, but I owe my distributor 950. So what retailers generally do is they don't take the Bitcoin onto their balance sheet. They hire a third party currency exchange who finds a fourth party with USD who wants to buy Bitcoin. And then they arrange this, they broker this complicated multi-party swap where the fourth party gives up his dollars the guy who wants the TV gives up his Bitcoin, um, the merchant gets the dollars, the customer gets the TV, and the third-party currency exchange gets their, um, gets their fee for that. It isn't exactly using Bitcoin as a medium of exchange uh, because of the instability. That's why this has to be done this way. But now think about it in a finance context. Suppose I borrow a million dollars worth of Bitcoin to finance whether I'm a trucking business or farming business or manufacturing business. I borrow a million dollars worth of Bitcoin. My monthly payment's about $17,000. And then Bitcoin, and it's a 10-year loan, and Bitcoin does what all of the Bitcoin promoters promise it will do. This is a bug, not a feature. My mortgage goes up to $50 million. My monthly payment goes up to $850,000. There's a technical term that the coroner will use when they take out my body, and that technical term is bankrupt. There's a problem with the uncertainty of Bitcoin and it has to do with its instability, which as I said earlier, is a feature, not a bug. Thank you, Keith. Uh, five minutes of rebuttal. Uh, take it away, Pierre. Thank you. Um, so I, I don't view uh, Bitcoin's exchange rate volatility as an uncertainty. I think that it is a risk. It is quantifiable uh, and you can insure against it. Uh, there is an active, very liquid market of futures um, where you can buy and sell futures at the CME. Um, and they have both uh, you know, uh, physically settled futures and uh, fiat settled futures. Um, so I think that to the extent that you can hedge against the exchange rate risk, uh, it should not really work in favor or against Bitcoin, right? Because um, in favor of it would be uh, me talking about how Bitcoin has outperformed gold. Um, I think that it would be in poor taste to make that argument uh, for this debate because we're not debating over um, speculation, as Keith pointed out, um, but rather uh, uncertainty. And I would just simply not put the Bitcoin's price under the umbrella of uncertainty. It's, it is a risk. It's not the only risk that Bitcoin has. Um, I mentioned earlier the uh, transaction fees. Bitcoin's transaction fees can be very volatile as well. Um, and there is a way to hedge against that uh, using a layer two uh, network called Lightning. Um, but uh, that, that would kind of go beyond uh, the, the scope of uh, today's discussion. Um, let me see here uh, to respond to, um, I think the, the argument that uh, Keith first made about uh, gold's long history, um, I, I don't see that as a praxeological argument. To me, that's a German historicist argument of uh, here, here, let's look at the historical record. Um, and I think that, uh, 
you know, we're, we're forward looking as people, uh, as, as uh, acting humans. And so we need to uh, be looking at the properties of these uh, systems uh, going forward rather than looking back. Um, I thought the coin trick was pretty cool. Uh, and I, I liked that. Uh, I could not do the same with Bitcoin. So I'll concede on that argument. Um, but what I can do with Bitcoin is that I can not only um, verify my Bitcoin um, you know, without listening for a particular sound or uh, tuning my ear, I, I have a terrible, uh, you know, uh, ear for music. Um, but I can do it uh, cryptographically uh, with uh, software, and not only can I verify my own Bitcoin, but I can also verify Bitcoin's global supply. And this really gets it to the, uh, I'll say, the one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin meme, which is that. Um, it's really, you know, if we expand that a little bit, it's one Bitcoin equals one out of 21 million Bitcoin. And um, that, that's something that I can verify using my own node, using software. Uh, and it's also the case that, you know, Keith brought up the, the, the view that um, it's an arbitrary number. And I agree, it is an arbitrary number. Um, if we go back to yesterday's lecture from uh, Professor Klein, uh, there, any quantity of money is fine. Right, so there's not. Um, uh, it, th I don't think that there's an argument to be made that um, you know Satoshi's approach to how Bitcoin's monetary policy is, um, is is objectionable, and that you know there needs to be an element of flexibility uh, in order to uh, dampen Bitcoin's price volatility, because. Um, Monetary policy that is discretionary uh, introduces uncertainty into a monetary system. And so that's how you have, uh, for example, with the dollar, that they can just add $8 trillion to the Fed's balance sheet overnight, and you just have a, you know, a, a nonlinear increase in, in the money supply. Um, and then w w in the case of gold, you know, I think gold's monetary policy has very little uncertainty. You know, it's just 2% a year approximately of the uh, above ground supply increasing. Um, but uh, the use of gold custodians, which was also discussed yesterday, um, has led to uh, tremendous volatility in my, or sorry, uncertainty um, with regards to uh, what the total uh, supply of gold Paper gold, let's call it. Uh, and uh, I won't indulge in the conspiracy theories because I'm not super familiar with you know all of those. Maybe Keith will have some more color on the. Um, but I do think that there is a slippery slope, uh, and it's not a, a theoretical argument. I think that it's this is how it's worked out in practice. Of um, using a gold custodian is more practical than holding gold yourself. And that leads to centralization of gold inside of gold custodians. Uh, and that leads to government capture and uh, to the fiat system. And so I think that um, that kind of slippery slope, the uncertainty there of, well, one day you have a dollar that's backed by gold, and the next is no longer backed by gold, is very real. And uh, that's it. Thanks, guys. We now move to the Q&A portion of the evening. And I guess there's a mic over there. There's this one. And so line up if you have questions. Uh, but the Q&A portion also includes uh, questions that each of you may want to ask the other. Uh, and uh, in addition, uh, questions the moderator might want to ask, exercising uh, moderators prerogative. Uh, I'm burning to ask a couple of questions, so I'm going to exercise that prerogative. Um, uh, in, in particular, uh, to you, uh, Pierre, uh, do you, uh, my, my understanding of gold is that it was now at a little over 1,700 an ounce, and that if, if it all, we're only trading uh, at a price to reflect its ornamental and industrial uses, it would be uh, have a much lower price than that. And so that, therefore, uh, the 1700 an ounce reflects uh, the idea that it's still a monetary metal and still trades as such. Uh, do you think that's ridiculous, or does it really trade just like an ornamental and, uh, and industrial metal? Um, so I think that it's just an empirical question. Without a doubt, there are uh, many ounces of gold in vaults uh, being held on people's balance sheets. And so... Uh, it is very much being used as a monetary asset today, um, and uh, I, I would I would say that you know the monetary premium is gone only when 
uh, everyone just wears gold as jewelry, uh, right, and is not uh, actually using it as a monetary asset. Okay. So, uh, it's still it's still monetized. Okay. Uh, now, silver is a different story. I think there, there's much less silver in in vaults. Uh, you know, the compared to it, the uh, annual mining of it. I see. Uh, any comments from you, Keith, about that? Any comments? Yeah, I was going to say, there's vast, vast, vast amounts. I've been in vaults that have acres. And most of the world, by the way, jewelry is monetary reservation demand. Uh, in the West, we've become wealthy enough that we wear jewelry that's less and less about the gold and more and more about the ornament. And most of the rest of the world, especially in the gold-centric sorts of places, and by the way, um, being a world traveler, I think I'm in a position to say this as an American. Americans understand gold the least compared to anybody in the world. We've never really had, a, we've never had a hyperinflation. We've never had a major currency crisis. The worst we ever had was the late 1970s, where inflation was whatever, 13 or 18 percent or something. The rest of the world would say 18 percent per year. That's cute. Um, okay. So yes, they're both monetary metals. Huge amounts of the stuff accumulated. If it was not a monetary metal, then what you'd see is a glut, like what you'd see in the wheat market if the, the wheat crop came in 1% greater than what the USDA estimated. Price would collapse, production would stop, consumption would be incentivized, and that would continue until the glut was worked off. In the case of gold, it's a 5,000-year glut. We've got a long damn time before that would ever be worked off. Okay. I actually have two questions I'm going to ask you, Keith. Number one, uh, uh, why hasn't the gold price risen over the past year or two, given uh, the turmoil and in the, inf the inflation in the U.S. market in particular? Why has it been pretty stagnant? Short answer is uh, there's a more and more desperate and urgent need for dollars, right? So that's the, the flip side of the gold. The other is that um, most of the forces driving what people call inflation, people have this mantra from Milton Friedman, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. I've written you know, article after article after article arguing that we have some huge non-monetary forces that have caused prices to, to skyrocket, namely green energy restrictions, lockdown, and then the whiplash, trade war. And it isn't just tariffs, but it's companies terrified that if they're, if they're sourcing from the wrong jurisdictions, that the government might frown upon that in the future. Logistics snafus, on and on and on with um, you know, problems that are non-monetary in origin. And of course, gold doesn't. Uh, respond to that. I see. Any comment on that, Pierre? Any comment on that answer? No? No. Okay. Was, was, uh, okay, then my final question for Keith, and that would be my last question, I put it to the audience, uh, is this, because uh, the the uh, the Bitcoiners like to say, uh, I know a few of them fairly well, that uh, the government can easily seize the gold supply if it really wants to, pretty much the way it did in the 1930s, when gold ownership was made illegal, but uh, much more difficult, next to impossible, for the government to seize the Bitcoin supply. Uh, does that make any sense to you? Yeah. And does that matter? Great question, but I would flip it around. So the government made it illegal from 1933 to, it was re-legalized in 1975. As in, it was a felony go to prison if you got caught with gold. So of course the government got the gold that was held at the banks and the safety deposit boxes. And a few gullible people gave their gold to the government. People were a lot more trusting of the government in those days than they are now. And most of the people hid their gold. There was a term called midnight gardening that became popular in 1933. Oh, look at that. The neighbors have a new flower. Huh. And you know, a meter and a half underneath that flower was the gold. So they didn't really get the gold. But as to the Bitcoin, since all of that is in a Bitcoin network, if we really ever had a rapacious totalitarian state there's a great movie called The Lives of Others, written by an East German who survived East Germany, he wrote this obviously after the wall came down, um, about what life was like under that totalitarian state. If we ever had anything remotely close to that, they would um, destroy the Bitcoin network and they would destroy anybody who participated in it. It got to the level where they had a fingerprint on every typewriter. So you couldn't type seditious, mess seditious messages. Of course, they know everybody's handwriting. The only way to plot anything was to say, Gene, let's go walk in the park. But people would be informants. 17% of the population were paid informants to the government. People would be watching, why is Keith going with Gene in the park? And if we spent more than a minute or two, if we did it more than a couple of times, we would both be taken in and we would discover the prisoner's dilemma as real life prisoners where I'd be taken to one room and say, you know, your buddy Gene's ratting on you. If you don't rat on him, 
you know, we're going to torture you to death. And the same thing to him. It was just a horrible, horrible system. And for anybody to think they would keep secrets against a government like that, uh, it's not a criticism of Bitcoin per se. It's, you know what, if the government is getting that bad, we got bigger, deeper problems. Like, is it even possible to live you know, in a system like that. And I don't think it is. Lives of Others is a great movie. It's actually got a happy ending. Uh, but, uh, P- Pierre, uh, do you want to comment on that answer? Yeah, I do. Um, I-, I think that the, the issue of uh, totalitarian government would apply equally to, to gold in terms of, you know, seeing your neighbors' uh, new flowers and uh, turning them in to uh, get some favors from the government. Um, and really, in my mind, the differentiator for uh, Bitcoin under this scenario is that you can memorize 12 words and you can leave the country and uh, you still have your Bitcoin. Uh, whereas leaving the country with your gold, uh, logistically, it would be much harder. Uh, it certainly doesn't scale, right? So if you had $100 million worth of gold, uh, that, that would be very hard to uh, transport across the border and not get caught. Uh, whereas you could have $100 million worth of Bitcoin on 12 words that you've memorized uh, and it's not necessarily the case that the government would be able to uh, figure that out. Okay, guys, you can uh, at any point exercise the option of asking each other a question, but let's let's see what the audience wants to know from you guys. So please uh, don't identify yourself. Ask a question as though it's a question, and uh, and address the question if if need be to the person you'd like to an- uh, answer it first. Go ahead, sir. All right, Mr. Richard, this one's for you. Uh, your last thing you had said before we started the question portion, you'd mentioned that one of the flaws of gold was that it requires an intermediary and history has shown that that can be taken from them. And while I agree that the state taking gold is obviously a negative, do you not see it as a an enormous positive that gold relies on the division of labor and that it takes advantage of that? It, I don't see the division of labor as something that should be avoided because... It, it is, I don't see it as an inherent negative, and I'm wondering how you respond to that, that why it's necessarily negative that gold utilizes the division of labor like that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think that um, if a job could be, can be automated, uh, we shouldn't keep it manual just uh, to uh, make sure somebody still has a job. Uh, and so uh, the division of labor is great, uh, but the reality is that as technology progresses, there are uh, you know entire categories of professions that, that would become obsolete and that um, have been automated by uh, technological advancement. Uh, comment on that question or answer, Keith? Any? No. I I think you know the logistical challenge of gold are are kind of being a little bit overstated. Reminds me when I was testifying, I don't remember if this was Texas or Arizona, and um, one of the Democrats who was hostile to the idea of recognizing gold as money was kind of grilling me on, well, what about counterfeits, and what about if someone steals it out of the vault, and, you know, uh, oh, by the way, we we use FedEx um, and get get it insured. We don't use uh, the Postal Service when we uh, ship client gold around. Um, You know, obviously, yes, there's there's something to be thought about there, but on the other hand, um, you know, do some Googling on Bitcoin security and ways that hackers can take your Bitcoin. That is a very, very deep rabbit hole, and I think much deeper than the d- risks and dangers to your to your gold. Uh, next question. Yeah, this question is for both of you. Uh, do you think there could be a cryptocurrency backed in gold, and would this help stabilize its value? Uh, Keith, take that first. Absolutely. If you had a crypto token that was redeemable in one gram or one ounce or whatever of gold, then as long as the redemption was real and you weren't committing some sort of fraud, then um, the value of that token would be um, whatever, one gram or one ounce. Absolutely. And yeah, I do think that's viable. Um, I do think that is the future, right? I mean, when people talk about the gold standard, I think there's a tendency of a lot of critics to imagine that what we're talking about is going back to the medieval times. We're going to wear sackcloth robes. We're going to tie our our, our, our waist with a rope belt. We're going to have the suede leather purse jingling with gold and silver coins in it. And, you know, the reality is today, you know, Apple Pay, you just take your watch and you go deet at the checkout counter. All the same things exist for gold um, as for Bitcoin. Yes, you can spend your gold. You don't have to ship it around. There are companies that um, if you want to spend your gold, they, they sell it and pay dollars into the Visa MasterCard rails or whatever. Um, I imagine that's what would be, uh, you know, the case 
comment? Keep, uh, I, I think that that solution would go down the same slippery slope that uh, past solutions have in this regard of, oh, well, you start out by depositing your gold at the warehouse and you get the warehouse receipt. And then suddenly the warehouse turns into a fractional reserve bank. And then, uh, you know, they're colluding with the government and creating a central bank. And uh, now we're back to fiat. And so I think that the reason Bitcoin minimizes uncertainty is because it's decentralized. The moment that you say, oh, these Bitcoin or this cryptocurrency is backed by this physical asset in the real world, you're reintroducing centralization, you're reintroducing trust, and thus uncertainty with regards to that trust relationship. Next question. All righty. Uh, this is for the uh, gentleman for the uh, negative. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, d uh, Mr. Richard. Yes. Um, and... You'll have to forgive me. I don't remember the exact wording of the resolution, but I remember. I think it was something along the lines of, "Will gold be the primary uh, currency uh, in the 21st century, or a major currency in the 21st century?" Uh, with you presenting Bitcoin as the alternative, um, my question is: If it's supposed to be the alternative, uh, I think it's reasonable to assume that most people would have to know how it works, how to use it, something along those lines, um, and. Anecdotally, but I have a feeling this might be common. I know people that are at the age of 40 and older that have no clue how a computer works, let alone Bitcoin and all the uh, infrastructure that goes along with it. So how might that dilemma be resolved if this is supposed to be something that a large section of the population would be using uh, in, instead of gold, which I know people that were old enough to where they were using gold as a small child under the gold standard, very intuitive. You don't have to have an education to know how it works. How would this dilemma be resolved? Uh, yeah, that's that's a great question. I think the um, that's the strongest argument against Bitcoin is the learning curve of how to use it. Um, so twofold: one is that uh, uh, brain plasticity can continue until a very advanced age, and so I think that uh, people can learn new things, and uh, that's that's fine. Um, two is uh, very morbid: uh, those people are going to die, right? And um, I've got <laughs> until the year two thousand one hundred or 2099, I don't know how we'll do the math, but uh, so um, uh, I think that uh, that's just how uh, sometimes technology progresses is just older generations passing away. Couldn't you run it, if I, may, if I answer that, couldn't you run it, you could give them Bitcoin coins, you give them Bitcoin paper, you give them Bitcoin checking, you could make yep. it simple to them anyway, right? Absolutely. And this this goes to um, Keith's point about uh, making gold more practical to use by having a debit card linked to your gold account, for example. That exists for Bitcoin as well. So um, I, I didn't, I, you know, I harp on that because I don't see it as a differentiator, right? This is something, this is a convenience that exists for fiat, gold, Bitcoin. Um, so I, I don't think that uh, it's uh, relevant to the debate. Uh, comment from you, Keith, as in the question and the answer? Yeah, I, I would just caution people to go down the road of saying, what if nobody trusts anybody? Um, the rise of civilization is that we can trust each other. And uh, if that trust is going to collapse to the level where the warehouse people are going to steal all your gold, then that means the doctor you know, isn't going to perform the surgery on you. He's going to steal your organs. We're, we're going to descend to the level of some of the desperately, desperately poor places in sub-Saharan Africa where if they think that you have a watch, you know, they'll just kill you on the off chance that maybe it's real. Um, and uh, hopefully we, we continue to have the kind of society where people can trust each other and we have some, some sort of rule of law. Uh, and not just for money, but for every other medicine, health, food safety, you know, you know, I buy a computer from Samsung. Do I really have to worry whether they've loaded it up with spyware? They have. Uh, hopefully not, right? <laughs> Uh, but, I mean, th w wouldn't that point um, apply to the 1930s as well? And, and Yeah, the 1930s was a major breach of the rule of law. And uh, ultimately, the antidote to that isn't a new technology, but it's a, a you know, it's, it's the Reason Foundation, it's the Mises Institute, it's, it's education and outreach to the population to convince them that, look, you were sold this bill of goods. You thought you were going to get something for nothing. That was the real reason why they created the Fed, is the promise of something for nothing. And but, uh, you got to tell people, number one, you shouldn't want something for nothing. And number two, it's, it's an illusion. The mouse never sees the, the spring-loaded piece of steel. He sees the cheese, free cheese. Right? As we were discussing earlier, Alan Greenspan was very well educated. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. He, right. He was a, a gold proponent, and that did not stop him from the temptation 
of uh, printing money, which seems to be a uh, inevitability, right? We'd have to change human nature. We'd have to re-engineer man. Or just, you know, have a population that demands their government not have the power. I, I, you know, I think J.R.R. Tolkien, this is what he was writing about with the One Ring, and in the movie for, by Peter Jackson, you have the scene with Denethor saying, you know, we need that One Ring, and but of course, put it deep in the vaults and never, never use it except at the utmost end of need, which means I'm going to put it on my finger and use it every day, right? So okay. <laughs> you've got to keep people like that out of power. Don't give them the power rather than giving them the power and saying, gee, why is human nature failing? People are abusing their power. And, and Bitcoin's proposition is give everyone the power, right? Let, let everyone be their own central bank. That's what running a Bitcoin node amounts to is uh, being your own central bank. And that way, uh, you know, you, you can be self-sovereign, but it also means that nobody else has power over you. Uh, yeah. No, that's not running your own yes. central bank. Okay, uh, next question. Hi, my question starts with Mr. Richard. Uh, I was wondering, by what logic would you think that Bitcoin will see further price stability in the future? And on the other side of that, uh, this is for the affirmative. By what logic would you say that although in a deflationary environment, there's still risk for producers trying to make calculations in an inflationary or deflationary market, why would you say that Bitcoin would have inherently less stability because of that deflationary market? So you have a question for, for, for both. Yeah. So for starting both. with uh, Richard. Okay, Pierre. Yeah, yeah um, I, I actually agree with Keith that I, I don't think that Bitcoin will ever be stable. I think that um, there is a trade-off between having certainty with regards to the money supply um, and uh, having price volatility, um, and that it is much better uh, for a money uh, to uh, go to the extreme that Bitcoin goes of having uh, no flexibility with regards to the money supply. Um, and I actually, I don't see any other solution uh, that doesn't reintroduce uh, human discretion and uh, bring us back to the current status quo of central banking. Congressman Keith, a question? Well, you have two problems. One is the value of all businesses. I, I take businesses in particular because it really matters. Businesses borrow money and they produce something. And if the thing they borrow is going up in value, then they're not going to want to borrow. And so you end up with a medieval uh, period where you have these little subsistence villages with a cooper cobbler and, uh, and blacksmith and nothing larger than a one person workshop can exist because nothing can be financed. The other problem is that when, when you have something that's intended to be a, a monotonic trend, so the dollar is supposed to go down monotonically, Bitcoin is supposed to go up monotonically, what you find is that since everyone knows that's the game and everyone sees the trend, the speculators pile on usually with leverage, and then the violent unwind of the speculators with their leverage causes violent drawdowns or counter, you know, counter moves to opposite to the trend. So you have huge uncertainties, even if Bitcoin's headed to a million in a couple of years. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I don't know. I'm not a Bitcoin price predictor guy. But even if it's headed to a million in a couple of years, that drawdown from 69,000 to 16,000 destroyed people. People were taken out in body bags. Right. Now you take, take a look at Michael Strategy and um, Michael Saylor, for example. He's not had a margin call yet, and he's talked about this on his public earnings calls. This is all very public. However, he's got a business that now has a very big interest expense that I think is eating most of his free cash flows, which means his softer company, which is what he's really supposed to be doing, is probably not in a position to be investing in developing the features that users want. Does he have any major competitors out there, such as SAP and Microsoft, uh, and Oracle, which I imagine he does, that are going after MicroStrategy's customers and saying the viability of your vendor is in question because of this bet that they've made, and is he also facing the risk of hostile takeover, all of which these are all things that are, uh, in Pierre's definition, not risks but uncertainties. It, it's really hard to model you know, in an equation what's the risk that MicroStrategy would, would be facing a hostile takeover bid or that... Um, uh, MicroStrategy's customers are abandoning because their uh, other competitors are convincing them that this is not a long-term viable, stable place to be, and, and you know, business customers want a stable vendor. So um, that that uncertainty of the drawdowns causes real damage, and then in the end, the price recovers. But that recovery doesn't do you any good if you're one of the people who left in a body bag. Uh, any comments from you, Pierre? Yeah, um, I, I think that uh, Keith makes a great point that one should not trade Bitcoin on leverage. 
Um, so uh, I would uh, underscore that. I think that um, Bitcoin's price volatility actually brings out virtues in people in the market. So uh, it teaches people humility um, and also to be uh, prudent and uh, not reckless in uh, borrowing and uh, leveraging up. Um, I won't comment on on Michael Saylor and, and MicroStrategy in, in particular because I, uh, you know, they're publicly traded and and you know everyone can go see. But I think their 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 liquidation price is thirty five hundred dollars. But even if it did get to to that, I mean, I think that uh, Michael Saylor getting liquidated and um, you know that that putting all those coins on the market would be great for everyone else who is interested in accumulating Bitcoin at a discount or. Uh, you know, at a much lower price than it has traded at historically. Um, but uh, I think that it it does mean that in order to hedge against uh, an exchange rate volatility like this, you got two choices. One, you can buy insurance, right, uh, by uh, buying uh, futures, but you can also self-insure by just holding more Bitcoin, right? So um, we've seen throughout the cycles that uh, the people who don't take on any leverage, who are well capitalized and who have a long-term view while understanding that there are gonna be 85% drawdowns along the way, um, they survive. They do not end up in the body bags and they thrive because uh, Bitcoin's uh, exchange rate overall on the long-term has trended up. Next question. This is just a clarification question on the resolution. So at what point would we consider gold no longer as a monetary use? Well, um, it, we, we've gotten to the end of the 20th century. There's a time limit, uh, 21st century, I mean. Uh, we've got you know another uh, 78 years. It's a, uh, correct? I mean, in other words, we're basically just looking at the next 78 years in the 21st century. Correct? Yes? I think he's saying, what's the definition? Can you falsify, to use that term, uh, the proposition? So I would say if, right, so I, I drew that flat line to make the point that um, marginal cost is less than marginal benefit. And after 5,000 years of accumulation, not only is there not a glut, we continue to accumulate more. The falsification of this proposition would be that that flips and stays flipped durably. So that is cost of mining goes up to the point where it's no longer profitable, or, or rather the price of, of gold collapses and to the point where it draws all the gold out of hoards oh. and into electronics and into cheap you know, consumer toys being made out of gold, then you'll know you've arrived. Well, yeah, thanks for the clarification, Keith. I, I see the, uh, it's a good question, and I think Keith gave it a good answer. Uh, would you comment? You, do you agree with Keith's answer? I, I think that's the perfect, uh, yeah, uh, litmus test for Okay, the, too much uh, agreement now. We don't, we can pass it. <laughs> But no, it's good that the two guys agree on the resolution. That's important. Uh, so, uh, uh, next question. Yeah. Hi, I have a question for Mr. Wiener. If you store your wealth in gold, but the price of gold does not beat the inflation rate, are you then really storing your wealth, or is it being rather slowly depleted away by inflation? Yeah, uh, is, is gold being depleted by the price inflation? So as, as, as I said earlier, I think it's because we have non-monetary forces that are driving prices up. By the way, much, much worse in the UK and Europe than here. Uh, the, both the non-monetary forces, the green energy restrictions, and the prices that have skyrocketed much worse there than here. Um, I have a uh, paper that's going to be coming out soon talking about this notion of a storage of value, like people think of a storage container. I think it's actually a fallacious idea. I don't think there is such a thing as a store of value. I think that um, the term that I would use for, for, for gold is that it has non-diminishing marginal utility. It has a, it's an economic constant. That doesn't mean that the government can't make goods and services generally scarcer by destroying the ability of producers to produce. If that happens, we get poorer. And um, those who own gold get poorer too. Maybe they get less poorer than people who don't or whatever. But um, you know, it's, it's generally bad when government is attacking producers and shutting them down. Uh, coming from you, uh, uh, Matt, do you want to pass? No, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, next question. When I graduated from Auburn, there was almost no such thing as a one megahertz computer. And now we know what an iPhone can do. So over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, when computers make iPhones look like toys, what prevents someone with one of these devices from mining or hacking as much Bitcoin as they desire in about 30 minutes? Um, you want to address that? People. Address that question. Uh, do you understand the question? Uh, yes. Yeah, what, what? Um, un unless Keith wants to jump in. I mean, Keith has background in software as well. I'm sure 
could provide an answer as well. But um, I think that um, with regards to the mining, uh, the the key mechanism that uh, prevents advances in uh, chip technology from accelerating the mining process is that every two weeks worth of blocks, which are basically batches of ledger entries uh, in the Bitcoin system, um, every two weeks there is what's called a difficulty adjustment. And so if the technology for Bitcoin mining is advancing very rapidly, then after, let's say, 10 days, uh, we will have two weeks worth of blocks um, because they were getting mined more quickly. Uh, and the decentralized network of nodes um, would uh, update the difficulty. And there's a formula for this difficulty. Uh, so that's to retarget back to having two weeks worth of blocks uh, for the next interval. And so um, that, I, th I think, is... Now, the second part of your question, uh, I think, is a greater concern of uh, being able to uh, essentially brute force uh, private keys and be able to uh, access people's Bitcoin um, that way. And, uh, th you know, the... The, the current view on quantum computing, which is basically the only way that this would be feasible, um, is that it's not within the foreseeable future that quantum computers will uh, have the ability to uh, brute force um, the uh, digital signature scheme that's used for Bitcoin called ECDSA. Um, there are avenues by which uh, that could be updated in the future so that it is using post-quantum cryptography and not vulnerable to quantum computing. But... Um, I, you know, th that was my first objection to Bitcoin when I started learning about it in 2012 was, well, you know, there's always a, a way to break cryptography. Um, and the reality is that at, at this point, um, you know, e elliptic curve or the discrete logarithm problem in math is still uh, unsolved. And so um, I, I think that, you know, the, the crypto cryptography for Bitcoin will continue to be solid uh, for the coming decades. Um, we uh, unfortunately we are uh, running out of time. Uh, please ask your question, uh, sir. Uh, go okay. ahead. Um, this is addressed to Mr. Richard. Um, so earlier you you'd said that you didn't think that there would ever be a time whenever Bitcoin would not be volatile, um, which to me sounds like an admission that you don't think that it would be universally adopted. Um, and from my understanding, it would either continue to be highly speculative and more of an asset than a money unless it's universally adopted. So what would be the, what would be the utility of it if it's not universally adopted? Because it would seem for pricing that you'd continue to need some other currency to look at for pricing. Yeah, it's a good question. If Bit is Bitcoin going to continue to be so volatile that it could fall by 70% or even 20%? If so, how is it ever going to become a, a useful money? Yeah, so that's a that's a fine question. Um, I think that, um, well, I, I, I don't have uh, lack of volatility as like the criteria to distinguish between a currency and uh, any other asset. I mean, we if we look at foreign exchange rates, uh, we, we see uh, volatility in foreign exchange rates, um, you know, uh, somewhat regularly. And if inflation today is is 9%, I mean, that's arguably rather volatile um, in terms of the purchasing power. Now, it, it does introduce uh, issues of, you know, uh, updating the menu prices and things like that. Um, but uh, as we have an economy that's increasingly digital and everything's you know on demand, that um, I, I don't see why prices can't uh, adjust uh, more rapidly. Um, I also would push back on the notion that uh, Bitcoin being volatile means that it is uh, not widely distributed or widely adopted um, or widely accepted. Uh, th there, you know, for example, real estate. Everyone's everyone's in the real estate market. Um, Real estate's still volatile, right? Uh, uh, home prices go up and down, and uh, you know that's. Um, I yeah, I I don't know if it'll be eighty five percent drawdowns like we've seen in the past, um, but it, I also just think that the price of money uh, can fluctuate, and uh, that's okay for the economy. That's part of the free market. Uh, this. Uh, obsession with having a, a stable uh, unit of account, um, in my mind, is uh, very Keynesian, not Austrian. 
Okay, uh, we run out of time. Uh, we go to the summation portion. Uh, you can respond in your own summary. Uh, the uh, the affirmative goes first for the summary, and uh, I yield uh, the podium to Keith. Five minutes. Yes, sir. You know, in a, in a certain sense, I don't, in order to defend the proposition, don't need to tackle the question of whether or not Bitcoin will stabilize, although I, I thank my uh, honorable opponent for conceding that he doesn't think it will. And I don't necessarily, in order to defend the proposition, um, have to defend that, yes, it is necessary for a money to be a unit and a measure that it is important for an enterprise to know whether it's dest destroying wealth or creating wealth. And the only way to do that, as Menger argues, is in measurements and, and money values. Um, in a certain sense, I don't need to prove that the dollar is failing, that the debt is skyrocketing exponentially, that the interest rate is collapsing to zero and beyond. Um, one other comment that uh, Pierre made was uh, you just hedge. Now, um, the futures market is something I've made a study of and written, I don't know how many articles, scores of articles about futures. And in my business, since we finance gold companies and gold, we talk about this all the time. They say, why shouldn't I just get a conventional dollar loan and then just hedge? And then we actually have some marketing material um, with a page with a headline, just hedge. And those two words do not belong together. Hedging is actually kind of complicated, has a bunch of moving parts. It has some, some risks, some of which are pretty obvious and some of which are not so obvious. Um, and then it has to be maintained. It has costs. Um, and uh, companies that fail to hedge, uh, you know, go bankrupt as well. Um, in a certain sense, I don't need to prove there's a, a quote, or at least Winston Churchill is reported to have said this. Um, God bless the Americans, he said, or is reported to have said. I'm not sure if he really said this or not. God bless the Americans, because after they've tried everything else, they'll do the right thing. <laughs> you know, we've, we've used gold uh, as money historically. It works surprisingly well. Uh, when the UK, when England ran the world's trade in the late 1890s, the system was so efficient that there was 160 tons of gold in London at the time of the peak of this gold standard. Today, the state of Nevada produces 166 tons. Uh, so it was very efficient. It worked very well. Um, I don't necessarily need to prove that we're going to do the right thing, as Winston Churchill uh, you know, gave his very perverse uh, backhanded blessing uh, of all this. I just need to prove the proposition or defend the proposition that gold is going to remain uh, an important form of money, not the only, not the leading, not take over as the gold standard, which my company is working to do, that's our uh, raison d'etre. Um, and in order for this proposition to fail, I'm gonna make the argument, thank you, that two things would have to occur. Both gold would have to cease to be what it's been, and this is not a German, uh, with all due respect, a German historical uh, uh, analysis. This is very much a looking at how it's behaving even today even though it is allegedly demonetized, or at least every government in the world would like you to think it isn't money anymore, how it's still behaving even today. Gold would have to change its, its behavior and do an abrupt U-turn. And in addition to that, either the failing dollar, which I think most of the people in this room agree is failing, or the highly volatile uh, Bitcoin, which my opponent has conceded is highly volatile and will always be highly volatile, that either the dollar or Bitcoin would have to change its nature as well. And if gold or uh, the dollar or Bitcoin doesn't change, then um, gold is going to continue to remain uh, an important form of money in the 21st century. And so if, if you're thinking about this proposition, um, are these things going to change what they are? I would just conclude by saying the tiger does not change his stripes. Five minutes of rebuttal of, of summary, Pierre. And as you know, you can't introduce any new arguments. You've just got to summarize 
what you've said so far. Gene, I didn't get all my arguments in, but um, yeah, that's all right. That's all right. Um, so I, I want to touch on uh, kind of the, the two uh, main takeaways that um, I, I got for, from Keith's conclusion there. Um, well, first on the hedging part, I think that uh, he's right. There are um, costs to hedging. It's not uh, a great solution. Um, but thankfully, you can self-insure, right? You can um, just hold more Bitcoin uh, if you are concerned about uh, its purchasing power going down in the future. Um, and the, that's a, uh, a fine solution. Um, second, uh, with regards to Bitcoin's volatility, I, I think that um, gold has been volatile as well. I, I think that we could easily overstate gold stability uh, if we look at its purchasing power. Um, now, we, we've heard anecdotes of, uh, you know, uh, an ounce of gold will always buy you a fine suit uh, or, or something like that. Um, and uh, it, it, that might be true over decades, but if we look at inter-year, um, there's definitely been volatility in, in gold uh, purchasing power. And I think that that's fine. I think that um, the volatility argument is really rooted in a rejection of having a fixed money supply. Um, and that the only uh, way that you can dampen volatility um, is by having an active management of the supply. And I think that that inevitably leads to uh, political corruption. Um, so to win the argument uh, in this case, um, my, my, my central contention is that Bitcoin has orders of magnitude less uncertainty than gold does, uh, despite gold's much longer historical track record, um, and that the, the, that is reflected by the tremendous adoption Bitcoin has had over the past 14 years. 14 years, right? I mean, it's impressive that gold's been around for 3,000 years and continues to work. I'd argue it's much more impressive that Bitcoin started 14 years ago, uh, and it is what it is today of having a market cap of hundreds of billions of dollars um, and a network with millions of users. And so um, what has been driving that adoption, uh, clearly the people adopting Bitcoin have not uh, been overwhelmed by its volatility or uh, have all been body bagged right, by it. Um, clearly uh, the uh, adopters of Bitcoin have been driven by other considerations than just the exchange rate. Um, now, one is the speculation, which Keith brought up uh, in, in his argument that, um, you know, people are, might be acquiring Bitcoin because they think its value is going to increase in the future. Um, I think that's perfectly fine entrepreneurial activity. I don't have anything against speculation. I think that uh, speculation is good. It's a part of the market process. Um, and that uh, there are plenty of gold speculators as well, right, who are uh, anticipating capital gains uh, from holding gold. Um, now, they have been disappointed, I think, uh, relative to the long-term holders of Bitcoin who have seen their uh, um, purchasing power dramatically increase if we zoom out to you know, five-year timeframes. Um, now, uh, I think that the other way that uh, I could be wrong is if Bitcoin's uncertainty increased. Um, and if we look at the software engineering of Bitcoin over the past 14 years, it has actually improved, and the uncertainty about holding and transacting with Bitcoin has actually decreased over the past 14 years, and I have every reason to believe that that will be the continuing trend. Um, now, another way I could be wrong, which I, I hope um, I'll be forgiven for bringing this up because it hasn't come up before, is, is the, the other cryptocurrencies, right? Although we, we talked about a gold-backed cryptocurrency. Um, and... Uh, they all have additional uncertainty added to them, uh, whether it's because of centralization, because they're backed by an asset, or because they are configured differently. Uh, for example, they might have a higher block size limit uh, that makes running a node more expensive and thus uh, increases uncertainty for users, or uh, they are adding lots of different features, right, to uh, quote unquote increase the utility uh, of these other cryptocurrencies uh, to the detriment of the uh, uh, uncertainty minimization uh, that makes it so key for uh, an asset to be a money. And so that's why I think that uh, Bitcoin will displace gold. I would argue 
will continue to displace gold. I think that um, part of why gold has underperformed over the past 14 years is because Bitcoin has drawn demand uh, from it. And uh, so I think that we're already uh, in the process of demonetization and that it will continue over the coming decades. Uh, thank you both for a very civil and lively exchange. Now, please take out your smartphones and vote again. Yes, no, or undecided on the resolution. Gold will remain an important form of money in the 21st century. I forgot to bring the soul form Tootsie Roll, but I will be mailing it to whoever wins uh, the uh, vote. Uh, again, gold will remain in an important form of money in the 21st century century, yes, no, or undecided on the resolution. Uh, drum roll, please. Uh, and, uh, okay. Okay. Um. <laughs> All right. Um, all right. The uh, the pre vote the, the 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 resolution was gold will remain an important form of money in the 21st century. Uh, the yes vote began at 47 percent, and it ended at at 62 percent. It picked up a little more than 15 points. Uh, the no vote was pretty flat. It lost a point or two, and so the Tootsie Roll goes to Keith Weiner. Congratulations. To